The past decade has seen the gaming industry change quite drastically. Of course, we saw the true rise of online gaming with the launch of the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360. First-person shooters like Modern Warfare 2 and Battlefield 3 defined a huge part of what gaming was for me at the time. I've always appreciated the competitive aspect of multiplayer, the thrill of actually going up against real people, and the memories I have playing those games will never disappear. But while I still enjoy playing online up until this day, for me they've never taken away my desire for great single player experiences either. I'll always love those huge set piece moments that put you in control. The games with relatable characters that interact with each other in a way that just feels real. There is nothing quite like playing a good single player game because of its more focused narrative. This is something that an online game simply cannot provide. With every year that's passed, graphics have improved, the scale has gotten bigger, and production values have increased. Overall, games have just become a lot more expensive to create. These factors have caused many publishers to head in a different direction that I and many of you will have observed for quite a while now. Multiplayer, shared world, service based, call it whatever you want, but these games seemed to dominate the market earlier this generation, and to an extent still do to this day. The reason behind why we saw so many of them shouldn't come as a surprise to you, they can make a lot of money. First it was through DLC, then the season passes followed, and recently it's been all about microtransactions. We've seen many successes following this approach, and major ones at that, but a vast amount also underperformed, and for reasons that aren't too hard to understand. And every time I'd hear a publisher talk about how linear games aren't wanted anymore, hell, how single player games were apparently dying, I constantly found myself asking the same question. What is it that makes you refuse to admit that gamers do want these games as well? A few weeks ago it was announced that God of War has become the fastest selling exclusive in the history of PlayStation, spanning over a total of 4 console generations and 2 handheld systems. When I heard the news, I can't exactly say I was shocked. God of War turned out to be amazing, and it's easily been one of my favorite games on the PS4. However, again, with the way I've witnessed the industry talk about the future of gaming, it should be remarkable to say the least. After all, God of War full on takes the traditional single player route. It feels complete and doesn't contain any microtransactions, nor does it have any DLC or expansion packs planned for the future. A long time ago, we wouldn't even be commending games for this reason, but rather treat it as the norm. The reality, however, is that God of War is an exception to the rule. Because if you've been paying attention, you'll know that this is not exactly a business model that's being relied upon anymore by many games today. There have been countless of examples of companies doing away with the traditional single player experience in favor of the more service based multiplayer products. An obvious example would be EA. Last year it closed down Visceral Games, a studio that was working on a story driven Star Wars project led by Amy Hennig. The motivation for it was that the quote unquote demands of gamers have changed, a statement I found very hard to grasp. What EA views as those demands though is not exactly hard to see, looking at the games it has in the works right now. Almost every current project by the publisher goes in the opposite direction, ranging from Battlefield to Anthem and its many sports titles. These are massive IP with a focus on multiplayer and the intent of selling lots of post-release content or randomized rewards in the form of card packs. This is a model that up until now has certainly worked well for them and the audiences of these games have sadly already fully accepted it as the standard. There has been only one exception so far, being the Battlefront 2 fiasco last year, where a limit had finally been exceeded and gamers spoke up that it was enough. Sales missed EA's target and the microtransactions were removed for the time being. It was a small but clear victory for the gamer overall, although it's not like that made the situation much better for us though. The constantly ignored screams for a Skate 4 turned its existence into a meme, Dead Space was buried alongside its developer, Command & Conquer fans saw their dreams crushed with a mobile reboot and I can go on a little longer. Electronic Arts simply doesn't care. But EA isn't the only company that's behaved like this recently. 
Sure, Activision has never tried to make gamers care about their brand, but there was a time not too long ago where I felt that the company still tried. I think back to the racing game Blur or the brutal prototype, both games that weren't on the level of amazing, but certainly gathered a group of fans. In the last years though, the publisher decided to narrow its focus to a smaller list of titles, but has therefore had to rely so heavily on the success of franchises like Call of Duty and Destiny, and the results shows. Black Ops 4 saw its campaign, a standard feature from the very inception of the series, cancelled. According to the rumors, Treyarch had designed the game with some crazy over-the-top ideas in mind, but Activision desperately wanted them to strip the game of everything that would make it stand out in favor of a more traditional experience. Well, that's definitely what they got. The entire thing feels like it was made in a much shorter time span rather than the three years of dev time it should have had. Whether the Battle Royale mode can bring some new players on board remains to be seen. And Destiny 2 played it safe in very similar ways. The sequel felt the exact same and somehow still lacked content. Post-launch expansions though were planned out already, but gamers finally saw through it and the game was dropped fast by the majority of its players. The service-based model may still work for Activision, but as these franchises continue to lose reputation, action will most definitely need to be taken sooner rather than later. Last of all, we have to talk about Microsoft. Just last year, Phil Spencer pointed out that the traditional single-player experience did not have a big impact anymore. According to him, it's service-based, multiplayer titles that are not only what gamers want, but allow for most revenue to come in. One year later, here we are, and 2018 has once again proven to be another lackluster year for them. Sea of Thieves and State of Decay 2 did not live up to expectations. They've managed to maintain a core community, thanks to their inclusion in the Game Pass program, but got mediocre reviews across the board. Both games still managed to sell, State of Decay found itself on top of the US charts in May, but let's be real, Xbox gamers are craving for great games right now, and had there been alternatives, I'm convinced these two would have never had the attention they got right now. Yet again, I kept asking myself the same question. What is the problem? Why do single player games need to be avoided at all costs? With all these examples, surely it's not hard to see that this total reliance on service based multiplayer titles may not be as successful as claimed by visionaries all around, right? Well, the reality is that these publishers didn't just miss the boat, they somehow decided to purposefully dodge it. Single player games have never left and honestly, they seem to be doing better than ever. While EA continued to spout nonsense about gamers not wanting linear games, God of War went ahead to sell 5 million copies and is on its way to outsell Uncharted 4, currently the most sold PS4 exclusive at over 8.7 million copies sold in less than a year. Horizon Zero Dawn was introduced as Sony's next massive IP in 2017 and outdid expectations at 7.6 million in just a year. The Nintendo Switch has been successful so far, largely thanks to Nintendo's own first party support and I'm mainly looking at two titles, Zelda Breath of the Wild and Super Mario Odyssey. Both have sold such incredible amounts that the attach rate for each is over 50% strong. That means about the entire install base owns at least one of these two games. Now obviously these are the major titles from the first party studios, but on the third party and independent side, the successful stories are also plentiful. Resident Evil 7 shook things up and went into a fresh new direction, and the result is that it's now in the top 5 of best selling Capcom games ever. Ratchet and Clank boldly launched at the price of just 40 bucks, but ultimately made Insomniac more money than ever. Detroit Become Human just released, but hit 1 million sales faster than any Quantic Dream game ever. And as much as I've been tired of Ubisoft's repetitive formula lately, Far Cry 5 broke franchise records and sold even more, indeed, than ever. I could go on and on. Hell, even Activision did actually learn its first lesson last year. It refused to bring Crash Bandicoot back for almost a decade, to the point where gamers had to literally beg them for it. Platformers were supposed to be a dead genre, yet when Crash finally arrived, 
found itself on sales charts for months straight, even a year later when it launched on other platforms. It shouldn't come as a surprise that a new Crash game is already rumored for next year, and of course the Spyro collection is coming up already later in November. Sure, you could argue that these are AAA games with a large budget, they're expected to do well. But it doesn't just stop here. If there's one thing that has been truly amazing for me to see that absolutely proves my point, it's the successes that have come out of the indie scene. Cuphead was a fantastic game thanks to its great art style and old school gameplay. Despite only being on Xbox and PC, it managed to sell over 3 million units, surely a worthwhile outcome for a few developers who had to remortgage their houses to continue working on the game. Then there's Hellblade, another gem from last year. Ninja Theory decided to scale down and work on the project with a small team of only 15 people. Hellblade was created as what they called a double A game, with half the budget, but therefore offered at half the price of a regular triple A game. The flood of awards it received seemed to never end, and the studio broke even months ahead of schedule. I can only hope that Hellblade served as an inspiration to so many small studios out there, and that this business model is one to stay forever. My last, but probably my favorite example has to be a way out. Led by a director who surely wasn't afraid to speak his mind, the game made quite a bold move by forcing a co-op playstyle on you, but while still being story driven and thus having a clear beginning and end. Your friend could join your game for free without actually needing to make a purchase as well, a very consumer friendly move that only increased my respect for the studio. A Way Out released to great reviews and its success completely took EA by surprise. The team is now expanding, and the next project by Joseph Farris is already in the works. If these examples didn't make it clear to you already, gamers want single player games. I've known this forever, and you've known this forever, but yet again I'd listen to Phil Spencer talk, or hear out an executive of Electronic Arts, and I kept asking myself that question, what is it that these people don't understand? Look, this whole service based fantasy didn't just come out of thin air. What spawned the idea was the free-to-play model. The games industry couldn't stop talking about it a few years ago, convinced that its success on mobile could be replicated for console gaming as well. A free game is accessible to everyone, and the money that a huge player base can spend on loot boxes, cosmetic items, DLC or other content is simply infinite. There is an element of truth to this that's something I can't deny. Not one single player only game will ever make as much money as something like Fortnite does right now, but there is one major flaw in this way of thinking. The space that's available for these multiplayer games to exist is extremely limited. There are only so many games in which we're able to invest a lot of time and are willing to spend our money. It's easy to look at huge successes like Call of Duty, Battlefield, Overwatch, GTA Online, PUBG and Rainbow Six Siege, but you'd be missing the point in expecting it to be doable to replicate this. The general audience of these titles play one or two of these games and maybe a sports game alongside. Outside of that, there is little desire to invest even more time and money, and the proof is in the pudding. The NPD releases statistics of the best-selling games in the US each month, and it's not hard to notice the overabundance of the usual titles compared to the few actual new properties that manage to gain a piece of that multiplayer pie. But new single-player games make it to the list all the time, and that's for a simple reason. The average campaign takes 10 to 30 hours to beat, and that audience of core gamers who love playing through these experiences will want to pick up something new and exciting constantly. I look at E3 2018 and the excitement for games like Death Stranding, The Last of Us 2, Cyberpunk and a dozen other titles like it could not have been higher. It would be foolish to think only one type of game represents the future for the entire direction of the medium. Variety is the key to everything, and as far as most gamers are concerned, they want both great single and multiplayer games. As time has passed, more and more companies have started to realize this, and that's why the success stories we've heard recently just seem to go on forever. 
And while I've gone over the direction that companies like Microsoft, EA and Activision have decided to take, there seems to be proof that even they might have been hit with a reality check. With all the massive titles shown from Electronic Arts at E3, the ones that stood out above all else were the smaller projects, like Sea of Solitude, that showed originality and escaped from the service-based chokehold of everything else shown on stage. The biggest surprise about From Software's next game wasn't the reveal of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice itself, no, it was the logo that followed right after their own. Activision is publishing the game, marking a moment of finally being willing to take on single player games again. And Microsoft? Microsoft announced five new studios. The initiative will be one of its biggest teams yet, led by Crystal Dynamics' former studio head. But the most cheering was heard just minutes later, when it revealed the acquisition of Ninja Theory. Hellblade was one of my favorite games of last year, and I have no doubt that their next project will bring back games with an emphasis on storytelling, that the Xbox One is so lacking right now. Despite an industry that told us there was no future to be found in single player games, the reality is they've never left, thanks to the gamers who chose not to abandon them. It proves the gaming industry can say what it wants and the gaming industry can do what it wants, but ultimately the only ones to hold the power to choose the direction which we head into are gamers themselves. Thanks everybody for watching yet another one of my in-depth gaming videos, I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, you can of course support me by either leaving a like on a video, sharing it with your friends to help my channel get more noticed, or best of all, you can support me for just a single dollar per month or more if you can miss it at patreon.com slash rowinggaming. Uh, by doing so, you get some really cool rewards in return. For example, I do a massive Q&A video at the end of every month that lasts like 30 minutes in which I answer all of the questions you submit to me. You can get early access to videos like these if you really want to see them early and provide some feedback to me, for example. Uh, and you'll show up in the credits of these videos and a bunch more awesome, cool rewards that you'll get in return. Uh, it's only through your support that I can keep making videos like this, so I would really appreciate it. With that being said, thanks a lot for watching, everybody, and I hope to see you again next time.